for coming to our um, seminar today. And we have a distinguished guest with us, John McHubo. Just, just to um, clarify, my name is not Jonathan Brown. Uh, he sent <laughs> his apologies. He couldn't make it because he fell sick and lost his voice. Uh, I'm Khairuddin Aljunian, who's currently also based uh, with the Al-Walid Center for Muslim Christian Understanding. Uh, John McHugo is actually uh, an honorary senior fellow at the Center for Syrian Studies at the University of St. Andrews. He has a very colorful background. Uh, he started out basically as an Arabist who did his uh, basic degree and master's at Oxford University and as well as American University in Cairo. And then went on to spend 25 years as an international lawyer working on the Middle East. I actually went through his biography. Really, you know, it reminds me of Imam Ghazali. Uh, this changing phase, phases of life. And in uh, 2007, at the age of 55, he decided to retire from law and then went on to become a historian. So I was uh, uh, telling him just now, it's like a roundabout turn, you know. Munkif uh, Min Dolal, basically, you know. The Deliverance from Arab. And he has written three books, very influential books, um, A Concise History of Arabs, uh, Syria, a recent history, and now he's just finished. And I would encourage you to buy a copy. We have it outside, and if you want the author to sign for you on the concise history of Sunni and Shiites, he has also published numerous articles on the Middle East. One of his articles was actually discussed in the International Court of Justice or uh, during the United Nations. It was cited in the yeah, it was cited Court of during that session, and um, he is uh, also publishing on other matters regarding international law. So I would uh, really encourage everyone to tune in and ask as many questions as you can. We are giving, I'm giving 30 minutes to the speaker, maybe a little bit more, and then we'll open up for questions and answers. Before I go on, I just want to say that we have a mailing list for all our future activities. Uh, please put in your name and your email address so that we can uh, be in touch with you. The stage is for you, Mr. Jeff. Thank you very much, Paul yeah. Dean. Um, it's a great honor to be here in Georgetown. And thank you very much for inviting me. As it's the Center for Muslim Christian Understanding, of course, my book is not about Muslim Christian understanding. It's about Muslim Muslim understanding, we could say. But I just thought I would tell you about two things relevant to Muslim Christian understanding that I came about <coughs> across completely by chance and which I'd know nothing about in the course of writing and researching this book. The first was, some of you will have heard of the Mu'tazila Mihna, the question over whether the Qur'an was created or is the eternal speech of God. And I was quite interested to, see, to find in the biography of Ahmed ibn Hanbal by Michael Crawford that it is asserted that when the Caliph instituted the Mihna, he said, this is because I do not want Muslims to do with the Qur'an what the Christians have done with Jesus, son of Mary. Now, I'd never come across that before, but I thought it an absolutely fascinating thing. It's irrelevant to my talk, though, so, I'm not, so please don't ask me questions about it afterwards. The other thing I came across, which is actually more directly relevant to my talk, was in the 18th century, in the 1740s, the Persian Shah, Nader Shah tried to have a kind of reconciliation conference between Sunnis and Shias at Najaf. He chose Najaf because, of course, it is the burial place of Ali bin Abu Talib. And um, it, was, it was for definitely political motives. I didn't think Nader Shah was a particularly devout man. He was definitely thinking about himself, I think, more than religion. But quite fascinatingly, a, an Ottoman Shafi'i jurist called al Sawedi was asked to chair the debate. And he was very reluctant to, because he thought it would put him in a highly embarrassing position. And he said, can't you find someone who is neither Sunni nor Shi'i to do this? And he said, either a Christian or a Jew, but a man of God who considers himself accountable to God and will therefore be fair to both sides. I thought that was a fascinating thing coming from the 18th century. Needless to say, his suggestion was not followed. <laughs> now, um, I advertise my talk as beginning at the beginning and coming right up to the present day. Um, 
I can do it that way, or I can be counterintuitive and begin now at the present day and go backwards. But when I get to about 900 AD or CE, I will then begin to, I will, have, I will pause and explain the origins of the Sunni-Shi split. Um, do people have any views on what, whether I do one or the other? Are people happy for me to do starting now and going backwards? Because that way I think it becomes relevant to today. And so let's begin with what's happening today. Um, there are a lot of people we all know who are not well disposed towards Muslims, Arabs, Islam, and so on, and who love to find anything they can do to use as a stick to beat the, the people they see as their opponents in some great existential clash of civilizations. This is an appalling thing, but I'm afraid we all recognize that it happens. And they do very often focus on the Sunni-Shi'i divide, an internecine conflict. It's interesting how often that word gets used then. You know, a, a conflict that's gone on for 1,400 years and will continue till the end of time. And this idea has become quite fixed, I think, in sections of the media. And there are also responsible people who are certainly not of the kind of mentality I'm talking about, who have rather picked it up. And um, I've actually got quite a great respect for Barack Obama, but I was uh, sorry to see that in his State of the Union address in 2016, he said, and I'm quoting, the Middle East is going through a transformation that is going on for a generation rooted in conflicts that date back millennia. And I think an audience would easily take that as a reference to the Sunni-Shi'i divide. He has also said on other occasions that ancient sectarian differences are the drivers of the instability in the Arab world. Well, we love to find um, a simplistic and nice, easy explanation for disasters, don't we? Particularly if they exempt us ourselves from any culpability in causing them. But um, I think it's about time we put all this in perspective and challenged this narrative. And that is what I intend to do and in what I have done in the book I have written. It is my contention that if you look at the, split, at the history of the Sunni-Shi'i split from its inception to today, you do not find in it an explanation for the disasters of the last few decades. It is a myth that there has been a pitiless new social Darwinist internecine struggle the supremacy between Sunnis and Shias waged ceaselessly across the centuries. And I would suggest go right back to the beginning when, Abin, when Ali ibn Abi Talib was rejected as the first caliph, as the first successor to the prophet. He came, albeit very grudgingly, but he came to accept the choice of Abu Bakr. And then after the death of Abu Bakr, he accepted the choice of Omar. And then he accepted the appointment of Uthman. And if, if, what was, if, if it was true that there is this internecine struggle between Sunnis and Shias, I don't believe he would have done that. But let's, as I said, I'm going to start now and go backwards. I'm not, going, I'm not trying to say that there, hasn't, that there isn't a lot of antagonism between Sunnis and Shias today, but um, I would go so far as to say that the split is only relevant when we try to under to understand disasters in the Middle East, when it has been manipulated, uh, when it has been given, it's been used as a cover for a political dispute. And the most obvious example of this is the struggle for hegemony, supremacy between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And I'm sad to say that both Saudi Arabia and Iran, have, and they're both equally guilty in my book, have tried to use Sunni and Shi'i communities in countries where the population is mixed as their agents, as their pawns. Um, think Lebanon, think Iraq, think Pakistan, and even, I'm afraid, think Yemen. The other thing that can happen 
is that what we call sectarianism, preference of one religious group over another, can easily be bolstered by the politics of patronage. And that can happen when politicians seek votes or when di dictators seek support. Let me talk briefly first about Syria and Iraq, which are the two countries I think we perhaps associate most with Sunni Shi sectarian violence at the moment. And I think it's important to start from the premise that both these states actually have a very strong secular ethos. Neither of them is theocratic or anything like that. But what has happened, what has led to this terrible sectarian violence is basically the power of patronage. If you are a dictator seeking support, if you need to find people you can rely on, who do you begin with? Well, if, like Hafez al-Assad, you took power by seizing control as Minister of Defence, taking over the state, you rely on your followers, officers in the army. Beyond that, you go to your own family members, your wife's family. More often than not, your wife, of course, will be from the same religious group. You go to the people from your hometown, people you went to school with, and it's very easy before you've gone very far for you to be promoting members of your own religious group. And that, sadly, is why today Adawis are probably disproportionately numerous among the people who staff the torture chambers of the Syrian regime. Think Iraq. Until 2003, it had been ruled by a Sunni Arab minority. Or to be more precise, it was a secular state in which members of a Sunni Arab minority held a disproportionate number of the seats at the top table. Why did Saddam Hussein appoint so many people from his own hometown, all with names, the same surname, Tikriti? So what a surprise. That town is a Sunni Muslim town. How surprising they were Sunni Muslims. How surprising that his feared Republican guard came from Sunni tribes nearby. You see what I'm meaning, what I'm getting at. But if we go further back in the history of Iraq, we will notice quite soon that what Saddam Hussein and his predecessors feared more than anything else was Sunnis and Shias uniting together. And when they looked at Iraqi history, they would see how Sunnis and Shias united against the British when Britain wanted to impose direct rule at the end of the First World War. And they might even think of how, um, when Britain landed its um, expeditionary force, largely composed of troops from the Indian subcontinent at, near Basra in 1914, and it fought its way up the Euphrates Valley. And when it confronted the Turkish army at the Battle of Shoeba, it was confronting the Sunni Ottoman Caliphate, if you like, or Sultanate, I prefer to say, but that, that sultanate managed to persuade many of the Shi'i tribes of the south of Iraq to fight on their side actively against the British. Would all these things have happened if Sunnis and Shi'is had always been at others, each other's throats? I mentioned India in passing, and I'm not going to talk about India again, but just one thing. When you remember the partition of India, the idea was Pakistan would be a democratic state for a Muslim people. There were a million or so lives lost in violence between Hindus and Muslims over the course of partition. But you don't hear of anything about Sunni Shi violence at the time, do you? And I wonder how many people today are aware that the guy who set Pakistan up, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, was himself a Shi. Go back earlier in time, the 19th century, I wonder also how many people know that that is when Iraq became a majority Shi'i country, when most of the tribes of the south of Iraq, from Baghdad further south, but also a few to the north of there, um, converted to Shi'ism. Now, their Ottoman rulers, who of course were Sunnis and were busy proclaiming themselves as the caliphate at the time, were appalled. They said, why are they believing all these Shi'i um, fairy stories? But nevertheless, they didn't use violence to stop them. 
what they did instead was they said, well, look, even if you become a Shi, you're still going to have to pay your taxes. You're still going to have to send sons of yours off to join our army. That's the way it worked. And that, incidentally, was exactly the way they also treated their non-Muslim um, subjects, the Christians and Jews. Now, going back in time, let's go back now to the 17th century. And as you know, that was the period of, in Europe of the Reformation. Now, in the Europe of the Reformation, of course, there was lots of persecution of Catholics by Protestants and of Protestants by Catholics. And they eventually came to a conclusion, for those of you who know Latin, in the Westphalian settlement, curius regio eius religio. He, the, which I would translate loosely as the religion shall be that decided by the king. Now, Iran at that time, or Persia, was not, of course, part of all of that, but it so happened that in 1500, um, a man known to history as Shah Ismail, uh, who was actually a teenage boy at the time and was a leader of a ferocious Azeri Turkish speaking confederation of tribes known as the Kuzilbash, the Redheads, he took over the state and decided to impose 12 Shiism as the state religion. Before that, apart from his followers, who seem to have see, considered him to be some so, sort of semi-divine being, the main people who mattered, the notables in Iran, were basically predominantly Sunni. And it may be that becoming 12 Shias was a kind of historic compromise. It was imposed from the top down, but it stuck. And from that day to this, um, Iran has been a major Shi'i power. In fact, I would say the major Shi'i power. Um, glance at the map when you have a chance, um, and you will see that if you take away the areas uh, that are Shi'i in Iraq, in Iran, which in those days included Azerbaijan, and the southern areas of Iraq, which, as I said, became Shi'i in the 19th century, you're really limited to a very few areas that pro predominantly 12 are Shi'i. Greater Bahrain, pockets in the Indian subcontinent, but some of them arose as a result of what happened in Iran. And in fact, I think if you would go to, say, in the year, say, 13 or 1400, probably the 12 are Shias were politically not that much more significant than the Druze in Greater Syria or the Zaydis in Yemen. But, um, so it was almost an accident of history that 12 Shiism became so predominant. But if we go back before that, we find, before too long, that we come to what was known as the Shi'i century, um, the period roughly from the middle of the 10th century to the middle of the 11th century, when for the one and only time, um, the world, most of the world of Islam was ruled by Shias. I'm talking, of course, of the great Fatimid Caliph, Caliphate, initially based in northwest Africa, but then having its magnificent capital that it built for itself in Cairo, in Egypt. And that became perhaps the biggest power in the Muslim world of its day. At its height, it even had the prayers in Baghdad said to the, in, in the name of the Fatimid, not the Sunni Abbasid Caliph, over a period of two years. It spread all the way down to Yemen. In fact, I don't think it's on this map, but there are still some Ismailis in the provinces of Saudi Arabia next to the Yemeni border, a relic of the Fatimids. So they were really powerful. But they don't seem to have cared what the religious beliefs of the ordinary people were, so long as they paid their taxes and behaved themselves. And um, it's quite interesting, the Fatimids seem to have been a kind of elite. They, know, they, call, they describe themselves as the awliya, the friends of God. Um, and they, they, they certainly believe that in some sense they had some very special status that was higher than other Muslims. 
but they weren't interested in persecuting Sunnis to become Ismaili Shias. And at the same time, over in the, to the east, in much of western Iran, Iraq, and even bits of north, what's now northern Syria, you had the Buyid dynasty, or should I say the Buyid family confederation, because they were mercenaries from Dailam to the south of the Caspian Sea, who and the three brothers set up different little kingdoms that were in semi-permanent alliance. The third of these, Ahmed bin uh, Buwey, or crossed the mountains, the Zagros Mountains, and went into Baghdad in 945. And what does a man who inclines to Shiism do when he meets the Abbasid Caliph? Does he depose him? Uh, yes. Does he abolish the office? No. He just appoints someone who will be a bit more amenable as the Caliph. And probably the Buwayhids didn't really, or the Buyids, didn't really think of trying to abolish Sunnism or to convert people from Shiism to Sunnism, because what, what was the purpose? Again, they wanted the taxes to be collected. They didn't want civil strife. Um, and of course, this was a, a massive humiliation for the Abbasids. Um, suddenly to find themselves ruled by Shias. But they cooperated with it. They didn't have much choice, so they appointed Ahmed, Ahmed bin Buwey, the uh, Amir al Umara, the, which I think can probably best translate into English as the Generalissimo, the guy who is in charge of everything military. And that worked. And interestingly enough, was the main divide then between Sunnis and Shias as we think about it today? I'm not actually sure that it was, because the Buwayhids, like the Abbasids, were scared stiff of the Fatimids, who were wealthier and had massive mercenary armies. Um, and so what they did was they cooperated together against the Fatimids in Egypt. And it's quite interesting to find Buwayhids, Buwayhid rulers um, conspiring with the Abbasid Caliph to um, attack the legitimacy of the um, Fatimids family tree. Because, of course, as they claimed to be direct descendants of the Prophet, that family tree was all important to them. So there we are. We've got back to the, um, we've got back to the 10th century. And because time is going quite quickly, I'm going now to go back to the beginning. And um, the family tree of the Prophet Muhammad. This is where it all begins. And there is a paradox. On the one hand, you can say the sunni shi split can be traced to the lifetime of the prophet, or at least to his final hours. On the other, it took several hundred years for the, dis for the split to crystallize. Let me try and explain that in my remaining time. The first thing to notice is, is that this family tree of the prophet Muhammad begins with his grandfather. Hashim. And Hashim, as some of you know, that is the, still the official name of the dynasty that rules Jordan, the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And it's an important point I'm trying to make here, because the Arab family structure, as it was in the 7th century, and as it is today to a certain extent, certainly the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia is a very good example of this, doesn't sort of depend on a, the nuclear couple. Uh, of husband and wife. Instead, it's the descendants of a common male ancestor. And so anyone who was descended from Hashim could, in a sense, claim to be a member of the Prophet's family. There is even someone else who's not on this chart. You see the name Ali here. He had a son called Muhammad by another woman who was not the Prophet's daughter, Fatimid. And some people actually made a rebellion in his name on the grounds that he was a member of the Prophet's family. This was a Shi'i group. But what happened was, in the final hours of the Prophet's life, the Prophet's death came upon him unexpectedly. He may not have realized he was dying until the final hours. And the community weren't quite sure 
what he wanted to follow. But there is one thing that is absolutely certain, which is that Ali, his cousin and son-in-law, because he, Ali had married the Prophet's daughter Fatima, believed, and I've no doubt about Ali's good faith in this, he believed that the Prophet wanted him to follow as some kind of successor. Not a prophet. Everyone knew that Muhammad was the last prophet, but in some way that Ali would be his heir. Now, there are political reasons that this didn't happen, which I can go, I can go into those in more details in the discussion, but the tribe that Muhammad came from did not want Ali to take over. The tribe of Quraysh, who were an aristocracy, and they were very powerful people, they were very wealthy, they were very cultivated by the standards of Arabia of the time, they were shrewd, they were very good merchants, they were the people who saw themselves as necessary to rule the Muslim community. And there are two names. I've already mentioned Ali, but if you notice, Muhammad also had a wife, Aisha. And Aisha was, after the death of his first wife, Khadija, the mother of Fatima, Ali's wife, um, only, it was only after, Muhammad, after Khadija's death that Muhammad took more than one wife simultaneously. But Aisha seems to have been the wife who was closest to him. And the very interesting thing is that Aisha and Ali could not stand each other. That is, I think, quite certain from the historical record. And of course, this often happens in families. When, when grandfather or grandmother, a well-loved figure, is dying, very often people will want to show their grief by claiming they were the person closest to the departing grandparent. It's only human. And so it's interesting, we have two different accounts preserved in the Abbasid historians such as Tabari as to who it was that lay, that the prophet lay in the, in the lap of as he died. Aisha tells us that he died in her lap. But Abdullah bin Abbas, another cousin, tells us that he died in the arms of Ali. Uh, what is the significance of this? Well, I've already mentioned that Ali be always believed he was meant to be the successor. But Aisha seems to have been very close to, <clears throat> to her father, Abu Bakr. And surprise, surprise, it was Abu Bakr who became the first caliph. Now, Abu Bakr was succeeded by Omar and then by Uthman. And now, by the time we're about a quarter of a century after the death of the Prophet, Uthman is murdered. By now, of course, the Muslim community with a, had a mighty empire, um, a very wealthy empire, and as always happens on such occasions, people began to squabble. And Uthman was murdered by mutineers who were basically dissatisfied, dissatisfied over their share of the booty. Um, that is the point at which Ali became caliph. And he is recognized by the people who we now call Sunnis as a rightful caliph. But he was also recognized by the people who we now call Shi'is as the legitimate descendant, the legitimate successor of Muhammad. Um, fast forward, and then of course you have a civil war. Um, Aisha was instrumental in raising an army to fight Ali. You see how deep the antagonism went. And two other companions of the Prophet, who had initially sworn allegiance to Ali, um, changed their minds, Talha and Zubair. Um, and then there was a battle, the famous Battle of the Camel, as it's called, which Ali won. And that was the end of that rebellion. But he now had to face the much harder task of squaring up to the powerful governor of Syria, Muawiyah, who was a kinsman of Uthman the Caliph who had been murdered. And Ali's position was compromised because the murderers of Uthman supported Ali. And they were important political figures, and Ali was unable to distance themselves, himself from them, even if he wanted to. Ali was murdered a few years later, 
and after that, the dynasty of Ma'awiyah basically became the Umayyad Caliphate. Now, I'm not going to talk much about the story of Hussein and Karbala, but we can come into that in the discussion afterwards. The important point to remember is that there was a yearning for true leadership from the Prophet's family. And when you get to the Abbasid Caliphate, which began in 750, that's to say about 100, almost 120 years after the death of the Prophet, finally there was someone who was you could legitimately call, according to Arab custom, as coming from the Prophet's family. And this was, if you like, a kind of compromise. But it did not satisfy people who thought that the ruler, sorry, the caliph, should be the descendant of Ali through Fatima. And that way you have Hussein and you have the descending line of the Shi'i Imams from, from Hussein. Um, why is this important today? Very often, I talked right at the beginning about how there is this narrative that I am trying to combat. Um, this narrative that Sunnis and Shias have always hated each other. Oh, it's all a history of blood. It's all about strife between dynasties that has never ended. Well, I'm sorry, that can't be true because the Abbasids ended in 1258. The Abbasid, the Fatimids in 11 something or other, I can't remember off the top of my head, and so on. These dynasties are no longer relevant today. But what did happen, and this is a, a cause of a lot of discord today, uh, since the growth of the Salafi movement and the um, Iranian Revolution, what has happened is that there is a question mark for Muslims a dilemma, a genuine dilemma for Muslims. All Muslims accept the Qur'an as the divine word, um, but what do you, how do you fill it out? How do you establish the custom of the Prophet? Do you go to the Prophet's companions, the people we know as the Salaf, a Salaf is Salih, that would seem the obvious thing to do on, at face value, because they of course knew the Prophet, they walked with him, they loved him. There's no doubt that Aisha loved the Prophet very much. So did Abu Bakr. And you look at that generation and then the next two generations who had some contact with them, the Tabi'un, the followers, and the Tabi'u or Tabi'in, if you like, the followers of the followers. And those three generations are thought of by Sunni Muslims as the Prophet's companions. The problem is that if you believe Ali was always intended by Muhammad to be his successor, and if you believe that Aisha and Abu Bakr and people thwarted this, how can you look to Abu Bakr and Aisha and many of the other Prophet's companions who supported them, and the vast majority did, as trustworthy sources for, for instance, Hadith? And so you have this dilemma. Um, if, on the other hand, you're a Sunni, you say, well, Ali, of course, he is a great source of Hadith too, because he was very undeniably one of the very closest people to the Prophet. The same goes for Hassan and Hussein. Um, if you go to many mosques, you will, uh, Sunni mosques, you will see the names of the first four caliphs. We call them the Rashidun, up in, up, up in the ceiling. Sometimes, though, you will also see the names of Hassan and Hussein added by Sunnis. And this is the point I'm making. The antagonism between Sunnis and Shias is, if anything, overblown, because people want to see a conflict. Sometimes there is a conflict, but not always. Um, because the martyrdom, Hussein was martyred in 680 when setting out to set up a rebellion against the Umayyads after the death of Mu'awiyah. He believed that uh, Mu'awiyah had promised the, the caliphate to his brother Hassan, who had died. Many people say had been poisoned on Mu'awiyah's <coughs> orders. Hussein then died a tragic death. He was stopped from reaching the Euphrates, and his little exhausted band, who were all, must have been almost dying of thirst, was surrounded and killed in a very brutal fashion. But you don't have to be a Shi'i to revere Hussein and his memory. 
Sunnis revere Hussein as a figure as well. And in fact, I've re read a very interesting study by Matthew Pierce called 12 Infallible Men. I don't know if any of you have read it. It's about the, biogra the Shi'i biographies of the 12 Imams. And he points out that into the 12th century, there were still Sunnis, or people we would now call Sunnis, joining in what we think of as Ashura, the um, commemoration of the and the lamentations for the death of Hussein. And then in 18th century India, you have the Nawab of Lucknow, who was Shi'i, and he actually built a palatial building to commemorate the, um, the lamentation for the death of Hussein at Ashura. And not only was this led by his royal elephants, the procession that led to the Imam Bara every year, but the Sunnis joined in it with the Shias as well. You know, the, these things are not necessarily clear cut. Let me give you a couple of other um, examples. The sixth Imam in the, in the line in the descent from uh, Ali and Hussein was a man called Jafar as Sadiq. And he is revered by Sunnis as well as Shias. And he taught two of the founders of the four orthodox law school, the Madhahib of Sunni Islam that we know today and which most Sunni Muslims belong to. These were Malik bin Anas and Abu Hanifa. And they were pupils who sat at the feet of Jafar as Sadiq, who definitely believed that he, as a descendant of the Prophet, had some special... Um, I, I mean, I don't want to try and express it in words because I think it's very difficult to express into words and I don't claim to know enough about it to try to do so anyway. But, you know, he believed that he had a kind of um, special relationship with God and that God would guide him in a particular way because he was the leader of the house of Ali and Fatima, the leader of the descendants of the Prophet. Go a bit further forwards to the 13th century, and, of course, by then, what we know of as ijtihad, the way in which a scholar who is learned and pious should use his abilities to try and discern the sharia. Now, that was something that had begun among Sunni Muslims, or the people we now think of as Sunnis, um, because, of course, while there was an imam from the house of Ali and Fatima alive, the Shi'is did not need that. But later on, they began to need it when the twelfth or final imam was believed to have gone into hiding, where he will stay till the end of time. And what happened? Um, a man called Alama al-Hilli, a scholar from Iraq, um, a, Shi a very learned Shi'i man, brought this idea of ijtihad into, Shi into 12 Shi'ism. And where did he get it from? From the Sunni jurist the Imam al-Shafi'i. And did he see anything wrong with this? Not at all. He f actually acknowledges his debt to this Sunni mujtahid. So I hope I have given you some grounds for thinking that the divide between Sunnis and Shias is not quite as great as it is. I do not deny for one moment that there's a hell of a lot of violence going on. I blame, if, if I, want, I, I have to blame, I'm afraid, really the period from the 1970s onwards. If you notice at the beginning of my talk, I hinted that there had been much less uh, discord between the two before that. I'm not trying to say everything was rosy in the garden and perfect, it certainly was not. But nevertheless, in the 1970s, when you had Wahhabi, the Wahhabi version of Islam pr actively promoted with petrodollars from Saudi Arabia, in an unprecedented way, although they'd been doing this from much earlier, of course. And this was very hostile to Shiism. It almost demonized Shiism. That's where you, well, in fact, I think it did demonize Shiism. That's where you get what we now think of as takfir, coming from, you know, telling other Muslims that you are not a true Muslim. Um, so you had that. Then you had the revolution in Iran in 1979. A final word on Ayatollah Khamenei, who didn't, and nor do his successors in Iran, speak for all Shia by any means. 
But nevertheless, I think we should remember that the uh, that um, Al that Khomeini's great ambition was not just to be the leader of Shi'i Islam, but he also saw himself as being the leader of all Muslims. And this actually explains the whole terrible incident of Salman Rushdie's book and the satanic verses and what is called the fatwa, though I believe technically it's not a fatwa, but the statement by Ayatollah Khomeini that Rushdie and his translators and publishers were all deserving of death. Now, as a result of that, his Norwegian publisher was actually murdered, and his Japanese and Italian uh, publishers were suffered grievous bodily harm, although they survived. But the point I'm trying to make is that Ayatollah Khomeini was trying to move a populist Muslim movement behind himself. And let's not forget that from roughly the, 18, the end of the 18th century up to now, um, Sunnis and Shias have together been confronting, as Muslims, how do you deal with the challenges of the West? How do you deal with challenges like nationalism? What should the Muslim attitude to, to nationalism be? A very interesting and open question, I would say. Things like constitutionalism, socialism, communism, all the isms that are modern ideologies. And in these areas, too, Sunnis and Shias had collaborated, I think, more often than they had been at loggerheads. Well, I'll end at that point. I think I've given you, I hope I've given you something to think about. And I'm very happy to ask questions or engage in general discussion, because there may well be people around this table who are not, know a lot more about all of this than I do. Thank you all very much.